which in some respects is one of the most exciting of the sessions that you've had. The, uh, we're going to first hear an unexpected additional talker who's just going to say one or two comments that f appear to be uh, very important. So uh, I'll introduce uh, uh, Ed Wolin, whom you all know, who has some words to say about octreotide. Just, um, just something real quick. There was a little bit of uh, misunderstanding on the part of some people in the... the yeah, okay. There was uh, some misunderstanding uh, earlier, I think, on the part of some people in the audience about uh, octreotide dosing. I think that uh, everything that's been said is totally true, that octreotide is remarkably safe. You can go to extraordinarily high levels. And um, using 30 milligrams every two weeks gives uh, really good blood levels throughout the month. All of that is all true. I just wanted to remind everybody that it's important to discuss octreotide dosing carefully with your treating doctor because if you use doses higher than 30 milligrams of octreotide LAR every three weeks, it can actually make it very difficult to uh, participate in clinical trials, which sometimes offer uh, the best treatment if you want to be treated on the NETR1 trial of PRRT or you want to be treated with various um, experimental biologics. If your dose of octreotide is not stable, and in many cases, if it's higher than 30 milligrams every three weeks, it's a problem. So just be aware of that. And also be aware that in some states, um, including California, Medicare doesn't pay um, if the dose is higher than 30 milligrams every three weeks. So be sure to check with your payers if you go too high because you could run into financial problems. So I just wanted to remind people about that because it's not a totally clear. Cut. Not, not usually. N not usually. No, that's not something I would expect at all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ed. We'll proceed now with our regular program. Our first speaker really doesn't need any introduction. He's uh, known to everybody. He's a giant in this field and is one of the longest uh, who's been involved with neuroendocrine tumors, uh, Tom Odoricio is uh, from, for those who don't know, who is from Iowa and uh, is uh, head of endocrinology and uh, has been involved in many innovations in all areas uh, dealing with carcinoid and neuroendocrine tumors. And he will speak about gallium 68. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Warner. Um, it, and I appreciate very much the title uh, because it's exactly two years ago that uh, uh, we introduced uh, the IND that we had at, uh, at, uh, at the University of Iowa. And at that time, uh, uh, we were preparing for one study. And what I'm going to do today is uh, bring you up to date on, on what the uh, protocol that we've done uh, is about and, and where we are in the next few minutes. So while I was thinking about this, I, you know, I have a little place in the mountains in Colorado, and every Sunday they have an art fair, and this is a semi-true story, and, I was, and I, was, I was walking down the street, and there's booths on both sides, you know how these art fairs are, and I was actually thinking about what I was going to say for today, and uh, thinking about Dr. Jean, and um, all of a sudden... Uh, the, the kids were ahead of me, and as usual, and the, the couples, uh, our children and the grandchildren were strides ahead of me. And I looked over, caught my eye, there was a booth. And the booth was kind of, a, it was a black shrouded thing. And I saw, but I thought the guy said, come over here. And I couldn't, I, so I started to walk over to see, and lo and behold, um, there was a, a, a very large man behind the stand at the booth. He had a tattoo, uh, born to raise tomatoes. It was right there on his arm, which is true. And he had a dresser, Harley Davidson. And let me tell you, you folks who are aficionados of Harley Davidson's, the dresser is the, the, the bike, isn't it? It's got those big leather bags and the double seat. And I mean, it, that's, it was parked right next to it. It was a red, a shiny red one. 
And I just walked up and I looked to see what he had for fair. And a lot of it was things that I, you know, I'm not too much into, uh, whips and chains and things, you know, things like that. And, and he said, I know what you need for your friend. And I said, well, you know, you don't even know my friend. He said, this is what you need to give me. And by gosh, he gave me this. It is called a debra. It's a rubber duck. It is indeed. And it says here, this is the wording on it. First of all, it says hatched April 26th. And it says, Zhao Pao Bam, we're talking stampede man. She's one ref whistling, hoof stomping, head spinning, carousel ride. So see you next time around. This safari is sold out. And he gave it to me. It's a rubber duck. And I said, I want it. I pulled out some cash. He said, no, you need a card for this. A plastic card. And I said, oh, he saw me coming from right down the road. And I said, how bad do I want to give this to Dr. Waldering? And I figured, real bad. So this is for him, but I'm going to keep it maybe as a prop uh, toward the end. You know, one thing he did say is, I asked him, I said, does it make sounds? He says, not in a normal tub. He says, it, it, oh, that's what he said. He said, he said, it only works in turbulent water. And, and I said, OK, because I knew that Dr. Gene probably took baths in turbulent water. He just did that. Way. So we got, but this is for Dr. Gene when it's over. And you're all invited to come down and see it. You just can't touch it or yourselves when you see it, OK? So, so now today, I hope all the handouts are out. I hope everybody has one, uh, because it's these, uh, the prints are kind of hard to read from the screens. But I'm just going to take up from where we were last year, at this time almost, uh, the principal. And Dr. Bushnell is, is going to embellish it very much. But I want to just share with you uh, the work at the University of Iowa on the uh, Gallium 68 and the IND that we have, the investigator new drug that uh, Dr. Sue and the nuclear medicine team, uh, Dr. Bushnell and Dr. Menda and Dr. Graham put together. So we'll just go forward. This is a slide you may see again from David, but it shows on the top octreotide. It shows on the bottom the tyrosinated octreotide. And as you can see, the indium study above, the, the classic one that we've all done with the octrea scan, is the pure octreotide that you take uh, regularly, uh, IM or sub Q. And you'll see that red uh, PHE, that's a phenylalanine. And that's been replaced by another amino acid called tyrosine. This is the original compound that they made with octreotide in Basel, Switzerland, so that they could study octreotide's action in vitro. Tyrosine labels with I-125, and so that's why they put the tyrosine there. We've heard a lot about the binding sites of these, and you'll see a lysine there. Lysine is the binding unit for the receptor subtype 2. That's where it binds to, it locks in in a lock key situation. And it's that bottom one that we'll be talking about, the uh, tyrosinated um, uh, compound, which is called Dota Tot. The, the thing on the end, the Dota is a cage. Think of it as a cage, and inside the cage, you can do a lot of things. You can put um, indium. If you want, a slightly different cage, but mostly it's putting gallium inside the cage. And you have a scan that we've been hearing a lot about and people are seeking in the United States. You can take the gallium out of the cage after you get the scan and you can put yttrium on it. And you have an emitter of about, as Dr. Richard Campo said, about 10 millimeter of uh, length for treatment. It's a very strong beta agent. And you can put lutetium on it in place of the Yttrium, and now you have lutetium-177, lutefer, which is the study that you've heard about, the Netter triple-A study that's going on. But the point is the arrow is identical in this case. In other words, the basic octreotide arrow modified with the tyrosine is the carrier. 
and the carrier goes in, locks specifically into SST2, maybe a little bit of SST5, receptor 5, but mostly 2 because of the nature of these tumors that they all are very close to all have the receptor on it. And together it's called theranostics, and that's the approach. The identical arrow with a different care, with a different radioactive material on the end, and you have a scan with that arrow, and you have treatment. And that's the principle of theranostics, and even for the and PRRNT. Now this is hard to read, so look on your sheets, but these are the characteristics, just briefly, between the uh, indium-111 octrea scan and the gallium-68 dota. The resolution is important, because when you do an octrea scan, it's like looking through the cataract in my left eye, okay? Because it sees down to about 10 to 12 millimeters well. But the gallium sees down because it's a, it's a PET scan that David will talk about. It's a different instrument, a different energy, and it has a resolution down to four to six millimeters. And it's, it's, highly, uh, it's highly attracted to the receptor subtype 2, uh, very, very highly uh, uh, attracted, as you can see on that uh, second uh, box on the left. And the radiation dose is very important because the actual radiation dose is low compared to an Octrea scan in terms of REM and, and activity, and David will speak to that too. But it has one, about one-sixth of the radiation dose that Octrea scan does, and uh, the convenience of it is kind of like the 24-hour urine collection, uh, lugging a jug versus uh, the uh, plasma 5-HIA, where it takes 24 hours at a minimum to do the Octrea scan with at least two trips, three trips. Uh, you can do the uh, gallium in, uh, in 45 to 50 minutes, and you're done. So this was what we talked about uh, last year. I just repeat the study because it was published. I'll tell you right now, Europe does on average 10,000 gallium scans a year, okay, a year. And they've been doing it for a long time, since 1997. The problem with Europe and gallium is that they can do it on a tabletop, they can do it on a street corner, and they can do it without a whole lot of reproducible uh, technology, and that's why the FDA did not receive the gallium from Europe, because there was no standard way of doing it. And that's one thing that uh, we, uh, that was done with creating our gallium 68 here. It was a standard of procedure that we have, and, um, and, I, and I know Vanderbilt did the same thing with, uh, without using the instrument, but that's the difference. So now we're starting up the road to get, the, to get a new drug application uh, for the United States. But this paper is the one I showed last year. They took 84 patients, this was uh, Gabriel's paper, they divided them into three groups, detection of unknown primary, biochemical suspicion, if they had it, uh, the initial tumor staging, and they had the number of patients next to it, 36, and post-therapy follow-up. All had the gallium dotatoc, all had the Octrea scan, high resolution CT was also done. And then they gave us the methods and the results and all they say in terms of why they arrived at the results that they did is that these were based on all available histologic imaging and follow-up findings. They don't tell you exactly what they found but they ended up saying we got true positives and true negatives and then they said the results showed 97% sensitivity to neuroendocrine tumors, 92% specificity for neuroendocrine tumors, and a 96% accuracy. Now those are very high numbers in terms of, and I use them, but when you get to the paper and you look at it, they don't really tell you, you know, how they arrived at those. They just said all histologic data was used and all the available imaging was used. So it was not a very detailed study on how they arrived at these very high numbers. Their conclusion was that gallium showed a significantly higher detection rate compared with conventional uh, Octrea scan. And that's, that was the paper. So based on that, we started our work last year. I showed you this information and it's now published. What we wanted to look at very simply is, if I did a gallium this week on a person, and a week later did another gallium on, a, on the same person. In other words, in, within the same person, done twice, how good is the reproducibility? 
because you want to know that if you have a gallium a year ago and you've had something done to you in between and we do another gallium on you, you want to know that that's real, uh, a reproducible result. And what we showed was um, we had five patients done twice, week apart, and uh, we calculated a lesion, we counted the lesions very carefully. Dr. Minda, Dr. Bushnell in nuclear medicine watched the, the study very carefully. We used the same lesions and we quantitated them. And the intraclass, that is between the same patient, the uh, coefficient of variation was 0.99 if you use the maximum uptake in, the, in, in known tumors. In other words, they call it standard uptake value. And if you, you use that number against the same tumor in the same patient a week later, the reproducibility is almost perfect, one being perfect, the correlation coefficient. So we felt very, very good that the reproducibility in the same subject was the right way to go. Now, this was the last slide I showed you uh, last year. And uh, on, the, on the right side is the Octrea scan, and on the left side is the Gallium Dodotox. And you can see, in, as you look at it, it's on your left side below the tip of the liver. You can see a dot with the Gallium 68. And this is what intrigued us. And now you can see it better in a cross section. I think Dr. B is going to talk about it again. But in the lower left panel there, on the, on the first set of panels, the lower left, you can see very clearly the uh, unknown primary tumor being the uh, carcinoid tumor in this gentleman who it was unknown that he had metastasis, but we couldn't find the primary. And this was the last patient that we did, and it was found, and he had surgery, and it was proven. Let me just go forward. So we took our protocol, and our indications were safety and efficacy, no neuroendocrine tumor metastasis, but no primary, suspected neuroendocrine tumor not identified by conventional testing with one or more abnormal markers, that's the third group, and the fourth group was staging for surgery or peptide receptor nuclide. So we, we reproduced, we tried to reproduce that paper from Gabriel, and what I'm going to show you are the three indications and what our results are so far. This is all preliminary data, but this is where we've come. For indication of safety and efficacy, 200 patients have been done. We've done 190 uh, that are uh, complete, and 120 have been analyzed, all with known neuroendocrine tumors, all with chemistries before and after, uh, and after the um, uh, performance of the tests and uh, they were evaluated statistically. Let me just turn this beast off. Okay, there. Hope it's empty. Good. Most common possibly related grade one event was flushing, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort. These were rare in the 120 we've analyzed. It's possibly related. They were all transient. We had a possibly related grade two event. I'm sorry, let me just turn that, just hit that thing. Just, just, just turn that button. Beat it, beat it to death. So the most common possibly related event uh, was the flushing. The next most uh, common possibly related grade two event was a slight increase in liver enzyme in the AST. And the only grade three possibly related to the study drug was a decrease in platelets. And that, these were all transient. They were all uh, uh, the ones that we've analyzed so far, 120. In other words, it's extraordinarily safe. The claustrophobia is not an issue. Uh, you can use a little bit of Xanax if you need it so a patient can uh, lie under the, the machine. It's not an MR machine. It's, it's opened on the sides. But it's really safe, and I'm sure Eric's uh, 60 patients, he would say the same thing. But based on this information, next week we're going with the data to the FDA. It is hoped that they will accept the safety and efficacy from one center, and this will now open the door for both the uh, gallium Dota Toc and the Dota Tate. And it's our, it's our goal and design that the American Society of Nuclear Medicine will get this and will have what they call the new drug application that should be coming very soon, we hope, and that they will be able to, to give out any, any uh, nuclear medicine uh, person, place in the country that want to do it, and they can all be charged for against insurance. And so that's, we're very, very happy about it. And again, uh, the, the player on this is uh, Dr. Sue because she's uh, given up 
the investigator new drug to the Society of Nuclear Medicine. And because of our nuclear medicine uh, force with David and uh, Michael Graham and Yusuf Menda, this is going to be possible. And the cooperation of Vanderbilt as well for the Dota tape. The next thing we did for the next indication was no neuroendocrine tumor, but no primary. We have 20 patients that we've had with histopathology of neuromets, neuroendocrine tumor mets, primary not determined. By CT, MR, Octria scan, we only did those in eight patients, but could not find the primary. Nine out of 14, 45% gallium, 68s were positive, as you can see. And, the, and confirmed by surgery in six. Two others of the three have been operated and the, and the primary tumor has been confirmed. So it's really 11 out of 14, okay? There was two false positives and three unconfirmed. And I told you the two uh, of the three have been confirmed. So we have clearly shown that with all conventional imaging, and again, we have, uh, we haven't, uh, we only used uh, ADOC TRIA scan patients at that time, but because of that, uh, we've gone forward, uh, and I'll show you the protocol design for the next, uh, the next year. Finally, suspected neuroendocrine tumors in gallium PET. These are 22 patients that had suspected tumors. They had carcinoid slash syndrome, carcinoid slash complex, loose stools or diarrhea in 22 of them, flushing in 21, elevated serotonins to about 300, never higher, elevated chromogranins barely above normal, and all had negative CT, MR, Octria scans. The gallium was positive, was negative in 21 out of the 22 patients. One pancreatic uncinate was read as positive and it was a false positive due to the high intensity of the pancreatic polypeptide cell which can make it look like a focal lesion in the head of the pancreas, and it was negative. And uh, uh, the other thing that I, we've noticed on these patients that we've done is that they come in with a history of higher and higher doses, escalating octreotide doses. And it's, it's remarkable because they've all had step-ups. Some have been on the pump as high as 13 units an hour for this, and that's 23 to 2,500 micrograms a day, and they keep escalating to control their symptoms. And it's just a phenomenon in this group, but they have never been shown to have the tumor. We've now stopped doing them because they've just all been negative without at least a CT scan showing something or an Octrea scan showing something or an MR. So our next study is uh, the one that we've started is that we're comparing the gallium toe-to-toe -to -toe with Octrea scan, done within a week of each other. And, uh, and they, we, so far we've enrolled uh, 45 patients. This is a grant with the same IND, and these are being uh, valued. We are doing them right now, and we'll be able to see uh, the value of the um, uh, gallium against the Octrea scan in terms of is it, is it, uh, where is it better and where is it helpful? So this is a real toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Octrea scan itself. And we've done 45, and the data is still being accrued. This study is um, the, I think, my last slide, actually. It's a, I have second to the last slide. But this is the uh, phase two therapeutic trial where we're going to be using the Gali, I'm sorry, the Yttrium-90 Dotatoc uh, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, PRNT, in children age 2 to adults age 90 with neuroendocrine tumors and all tumors that are somatostatin receptor expressing. That includes children with uh, medulloblastoma, glioblastoma. It includes all tumors that are SSTR positive. So it's, it's an open phase 2. We intend for it to go until the absolute indicate until the approval of the FDA uh, for the Y90. And this study is designed, you don't have to show progression. That's been talked about how far along these patients are when they get the PRRT. It's very, uh, we're going to be moving that clock back and treating them sooner. Uh, they do not have to be progressing, and that's a big thing. They, they can be stable with one identifiable lesion. And uh, there's no control on this. Everybody gets the Y90. 
and we're very, very pleased with it. And again, it's the work of Dr. Sue and her uh, investigator, new drug that she has for both children and adults. She's the only place in the world that can treat the children with this. And, um, and it's with the cooperation of Dr. Menda and Dr. Bushnell and our nuclear medicine team that will happen. We're very excited about it. And uh, they've talked a little bit about maybe more safety with the lutetium. But this study is designed very carefully so that after the first dose, standard dose of Y90, there'll be dosimetry on the kidneys and the marrow. And we will then adjust the next two doses, the next two therapies, in a customized way. So patients may get more or get less of the next two doses. And uh, we, in our first series that David authored, uh, uh, our first uh, work with this, our phase two international, we had only two uh, renal, grade two renal um, problems with, uh, with our patients in that study. There were over 98 patients in it and they both were reversed. So we have never seen the renal toxicity that was described early on with Y90, and we won't see it with this study either. It is set to open in 30 days, so we'll have that. And people have asked, where do you find out about these things? I think you saw it on the bottom of the sheet, www.clinicaltrials.gov. When it hits that, when it hits that website, it's ongoing and up and approved. So that's one way that uh, you can follow this uh, and find out what's available throughout the country. That includes the studies that you heard yesterday from medical oncology. All of those trials are in there and can be found when they're, when they're up and present. This one's for Dr. Gene. He's asked several times, real-time analysis of 46 patients undergoing the gallium for staging of disease. Does it make a difference in terms of what you do next with what you know? He's been asking that for a year, and so far we've done 46 patients, Dr. Gene. We followed them pre and post uh, gallium pets, and the final report, major change in management we found was done, was done in 17 of 46 patients. 37% of the patients that had the gallium had, uh, had a change in management of their, of their tumors. Surgery for primary, surgery for recurrence, recur, uh, referral for PRT, or even cancellation of surgery. And this was all done in a prospective, retrospective fashion. And this one is, I think, starting to answer the question that Dr. Jean has raised. Does it make a difference? With, does a gallium 68 make a difference in management? It's a great question, and we're teasing a little bit of it out, and uh, we hope uh, that it holds, but we're seeing 37%. And so I'm going to stop right there, and thank you very much for the opportunity.